Hi Donovan, let me first start off by saying I really enjoy the show, and thanks for posting content on a regular basis. I became fascinated with cryptids after my 2018 encounter. Well, I should say a sighting rather than an encounter. This took place when I was on-site working for one of our clients. I'm a safety consultant, and one of my clients is a power company that has about 30 wind turbines in western Pennsylvania. I was doing a safety inspection on the FAA lighting on top of the wind turbine. We go up at least once a quarter to do routine inspections. The first few times I had to do these inspections were a little freaky because sometimes I have to crawl through this 18 inch hatch on the nose of the turbine. Now getting up one of these wind turbines is quite the task, unless you're going up one with an elevator. Most of them have sections of ladders where you have to climb up 300 feet to the top. The first time I climbed, my arms were just dead. We do have some people who can climb in four minutes, and I've even seen one guy take six hours to get to the top and three hours to get down. However, he was pushing about 400 pounds. Anyway, so I'm up there doing an inspection with another employee at our safety firm. We always go up in pairs to make sure we're tied off properly, and most tasks just require two people. We're looking around for a bit, just taking in the view before we begin our inspection, because it took us 35 minutes to get to the top. It's a gorgeous view from the top. It's like being on top of a building and looking out over a city. However, the turbine is in the middle of a field and is surrounded by woods on all sides. There are trees everywhere, as well as brush and grass. We were 300 feet up in the air, so you can imagine the view was breathtaking. Everything, of course, looks a lot smaller from up there, but my coworker also brought a small set of binoculars with him. When I looked over to the east, I saw what appeared to be this really large animal in a clearing just outside of the woods. It's hard to tell, but it looked like it was laying down. I couldn't make out any other details other than the fact that it was very large. It looked like this brownish gray color, and it just blended in with the grass and brush around it. I asked my coworker if I could use his binoculars, and he handed them to me. I tried looking for a few minutes, but... It just blended in with the landscape. Then I saw it stand up. It was standing up and walking on two legs. It looked like a very large bear with an ape-like face, almost human and really broad shoulders. It was walking around picking berries and eating them. I'm standing there watching this creature. Then I say, holy hell, I think that is a Sasquatch. My coworker immediately grabs the binoculars from me and says, give those to me. Let me see what you're looking at. The next words out of his mouth were, holy crap, dude, you're right. What is it doing here? I said, I have no idea. We were up there for another 20 minutes looking at this thing before we finally had to get our safety inspections done. When we finished our inspections, we looked again, but it must have left because we couldn't find it anywhere. After we climbed down, we talked with one of the workers at the power company about what we saw. And he said, oh, you saw Harry too? I was like, what, Harry? He said, yeah, we call him Harry. We see him quite often when we do maintenance up there. There's about six of us who tried to go out and locate him on the ground several times, but we never find him. He's gotta be super aware of his surroundings because he is never seen on the ground. I got to be part of a hiking expedition that occurred out in the Rockies, and in a very swift moment, I had been turned around and separated from the other hikers. This is a hiker's worst nightmare. I was very inexperienced at the time. I found myself in a landscape that was not consistent with what I knew about the Rocky Mountains. The ground turned coarse and full of rubble. Plants seemed practically non-existent, and a thick mist was rising cutting me off from getting my bearings. Worse yet, I couldn't hear the group at all. Several times I tried screaming at the top of my lungs, just to see if I could get anybody to answer me. There was nothing, nothing but the faintest sound around me. In fact, sometimes it seemed like nature itself was silent, shushing me to stay silent with it. 
The first sign that things were not right was the article of clothing I found. I came across a pink denim cap of one of the people that had been hiking in my group. I didn't remember the girl's name, but I distinctively remember that faded pink cap for some reason. I am one of those people that can remember far more details than I can a person's name. But that's just how it is. I picked that up with the intention of eventually returning it to her. I dared to take the sight of the hat as a sign of hope. Perhaps I was near them after all. But how could she have dropped the hat and not realized? It didn't really make sense. The hope was short-lived when I came across a backpack that had also belonged to someone in my group, but I couldn't place who it was. I continued through the thickening fog with the distinct feeling that I was going in circles. My rations and supplies were very limited. If this continued, I would have no choice but to perish out here all alone. I came across another possession of one of my track mates. This time there was a new level of bad news. It was a bandana that I remember seeing on one of the guys with spiked hair. It was stained with something dark and red, and I knew what that was. I just didn't want to admit it. I couldn't fathom my brain going there. It was at that point that I began to feel panic stalking me from a distance. My first thought was that robbers had come upon my group. Or maybe not robbers, but modern day bandits. I don't know. Something had clearly happened to them. I hadn't heard any noise that would suggest a big bear or big cat attack. No screaming, no crying, nothing. I even looked in the dirt. There didn't seem to be any signs of a struggle. It's as if their clothing had just fallen. So I quickened my pace, with the visibility reducing by the minute. And the things I could see were things that I didn't want to. I came across a pair of shattered glasses that were all too similar to the pair worn by the Asian girl in my group. Then there was the torn sports bra that was also bloodstained. One article after another that I could recognize as being from my group emerged out of the fog as I pressed onward, and my own sanity was beginning to teeter, so I broke into a light jog, even though the ground and the visibility was treacherous. The path began to lower with the unusual rocky ground rising on either side of me. Then, just like that, the trail went into a small cave. Small enough that if I wanted to get inside, I would have had to stoop down. Something inside me wanted to turn and run, but my curiosity overrode my primal caution. So I struck up my lighter and reached into the cave. What came next, I remember only in parts because my mind evidently was closer to breaking than I had realized at that time. The halo of the flame showed nothing but rock at first, but then a pair of eyes had turned to me from somewhere at the edge of the light's influence, and then another, and more. Then the light showed me towering furry bodies that were hunched at the back as if they were all used to a life of crouching and hiding. I hate to tell you this part because it's going to sound like I'm crazy, but I can only tell you exactly what they resembled, and what they resembled were werewolves. That's the worst word to use with the complete overexposure that this thing has gotten, but honestly, there's no other word to describe what animal I saw. Their teeth extended well past their lips, and I can tell you that they had long ears that looked like horns almost. Their mouths were busy chewing and gnashing something. I could hear the sounds of ripping and tearing. It was meat. They were eating on something that I couldn't see. I immediately worked my way out, and they didn't give chase. I'll never know why. Maybe there's a reason they didn't get to me. I'll never know. After climbing my way out, luckily I eventually found a trail, even though I was completely and utterly traumatized. I ended up contacting the authorities, and they did a very thorough investigation and did a search of the area, but didn't uncover anything, which is surprising. I told them about the bloody clothes and all the belongings they had left behind, that they were attacked by large unknown predators. They didn't really seem to take my story seriously. In fact, I was even a suspect in a potential murder since they disappeared, but nothing they found was conclusive. 
I even told them there was a cave where these beasts lived in. I understand this story is sounding more and more crazy as I go on, but this is my experience that I have to live with, forever, for the rest of my life. I don't get to just shut it off. And then of course, after all of that, I have the trauma of dealing with being a potential suspect in their disappearance, which didn't result in anything because like I said, they couldn't find anything conclusive that led to me. Anyway, they're all gone now. This was almost nine years ago, and I still have to live with that pain. And I've only told a handful of people in hopes that somebody can give me reassurance that things will be okay and that I'll be able to get through this. The story I'm about to tell you happened to me about 10 years ago when we first moved into our house. We live in the countryside in a small remote neighborhood. I have a job in the city so it takes about an hour to commute to work, but I never minded it. I liked the idea of having some privacy to think and play any music I wanted. I also wanted my kids to grow up around clean, fresh air so the drive was worth it. I typically would leave work late at night when it was already getting dark. I'm a realtor so usually after a day of showing houses I have some paperwork to finish. Sometimes this means that I'm not heading home until 9 or 10 at night. The road I take to get home is really rural. It has no street lights and it's surrounded by forest on both sides. I always had to rely on my headlights to help guide me. One night I was on my way home when off in the distance I could make out a group of elk running across the street. They were plentiful in this part of Pennsylvania and not unusual to see them in the woods. But this time as I got closer to the spot where the elk had passed, something huge ran in front of my car so fast that I barely got a look at it. It looked like it might have been a bear, but moved faster than any bear that I've seen. The movement made me jump in my seat, turning my steering wheel and swerving the car into the ditch in the side of the road. My head jolted forward on impact and hit the steering wheel. The windshield had cracked from the impact, and I lifted my hand to check out my head and felt blood running down the side of my face, but I felt I was okay for the most part. I lifted my head to look in the rearview mirror to check out my face, and that's when I saw it, standing behind the car in the middle of the road. The body was sort of like a man, but it was covered in hair. This dark brown hair, but it had the face of an ape. It was huge, and with me being down in the ditch, it loomed over the car in the moonlight. The creature took a few steps towards the car, then stopped as if it heard something in the woods. It lifted its head and sniffed the air, and then it took off in the direction of the elk. I got out of my car and looked around. I wasn't sure what I had seen. This thing was very muscular, and it didn't make a sound until I heard the screams followed by a powerful yelping noise. On this section of the road, I didn't have any signal on my cell phone. I wasn't exactly sure how to explain what I had just seen when I got home. The ditch was deep and muddy, which made it difficult for the tires to pull out. After trying for a bit, I got out of the car and realized it just wasn't happening. I had just dug myself deeper in the mud trying to get out. I waited around for a while to see if a car might drive by, but when none came, I decided to walk home, thinking that in the morning I would call a tow truck. I was only about 5 miles from home which in the car might be around 10 minutes, but I still had an hour of walking at least. While I was grabbing some stuff from the car, I looked behind me in the direction the animals ran. It's not like I was going to follow them, but for a brief moment, it looked like something was staring at me from the brush. I took a deep breath and focused on making my way home, praying that a car might come along this backcountry road to give me a ride back. Thankfully, I would brought a flashlight with me, so I was able to use that. I hadn't gotten far when I heard rustling and saw movement in the bushes along the side of the road. I shined my light in that direction, but the movement stopped. Now I started to get spooked and sped up my pace. It wasn't long until I started to hear the bushes move again. Then out of nowhere, I heard a scream. But before I could look and turn in that direction, an elk ran past within inches of me, almost knocking me to the ground. I started to run as fast as I could. 
I heard this yelping sound behind me, and at the same time I saw headlights approaching. I flagged down the oncoming car to ask the driver if I could get a ride in the direction of my house. The man, who looked to be in his 60s, said that it wouldn't be a problem. He said that he was headed in that direction anyway, and then he asked me what I was doing out here this late at night. I explained to him what had happened, that I swerved to avoid hitting an animal with my car and I ended up in the ditch. He seemed interested and started asking me questions about the animal. I was hesitant at first, but then I decided to explain exactly what I saw. A big hairy ape-like animal standing upright that let out this high-pitched scream that sounded like a human. The man listened quietly. I thought for sure he thought I was drunk or something. I eventually got dropped off in my house and was able to pick up my car the next day. When they towed my car, they said the front driver's side window was completely smashed in and the entire car smelled horrible. Hi Donovan, I love the show and I just wanted to say thanks in advance for reading my story. It's not actually my story, it's my grandfather's. My grandfather told me this story before he passed away. This happened when he was in Vietnam. He was a soldier in the Vietnam War and was stationed at an outpost somewhere in the Central Highlands. He said that he was on guard duty at an outpost that had a fence around it in the middle of the jungle. He had to keep guard during the night. The Viet Cong carried little with them and they moved pretty quickly. They stayed hidden during the day and came out at night to sneak in the villages, catch American soldiers in ambushes and other missions. The Viet Cong used to dress like farmers. American soldiers didn't know who was a farmer and who was a farmer fighting for the Viet Cong. He fought on the ground in Vietnam, which was different from what U.S. soldiers had done before. There were no front lines in Vietnam. The war was everywhere. A peasant who seems harmless could be a guerrilla. A pretty prostitute could be a secret agent. And the kid who brought the laundry could be a spy. Flooded rice fields hid spikes. The jungles were full of booby traps. And the enemy could easily attack barracks. He told me that they had this steel container at their outpost that was dropped off by helicopter shortly after they set up the outpost. It was a 12 by 12 by 12 steel cube, basically. This was a small outpost, so there was less than a dozen men there. Nothing that could withstand an attack from a larger group of VCs. They weren't told much about what was in that steel container when it was dropped off, but his commander said it's our secret weapon. That's all he really said. He thought it was some type of weapon or a bomb at the time and it ended up being a very destructive weapon. However, I'll get to that in a minute. A few days goes by and he's doing night watch on their guard tower when he notices some movement on the jungle floor. He can pick up someone talking in Vietnamese and radios to the soldiers on the ground that they have company about 50 to 75 yards to their east. From what he can tell, there's at least two dozen men and they are outnumbered easily two to one. He receives radio confirmation from one of the soldiers on the ground, and 30 seconds later he hears the commander give instructions to the ground team to open the vault. What happened next, my grandfather had a first row seat to the carnage and mayhem that pursued. He said that the ground team opened up that steel container and something came out of it. He said it looked like a cross between a wolf, a man, and a hyena. It had dark brown hair all over its body in this long snout. The thing had arms like a man, but they were longer than normal. It had very broad shoulders and it was muscular, almost like a gorilla. It walked out on all fours, then it stood up on its hind legs, which had to put it at at least seven feet tall. And it jumped from the ground over a 12 foot fence with ease. It blended in so well with the terrain as it moved through the jungle floor. My grandfather said he was up in his post watching this all unfold with his night vision on. This thing sniffs in the air like it was getting a read on where all of these men were at. Once done, it gets on all fours and swiftly and quickly started moving towards the enemy soldiers. 
Everything went dead silent. No more talking. No more movement that you could audibly hear. It's like someone just froze the jungle in that moment of time. No bug sounds or animals. The next thing he hears is this ungodly sounding screaming howling noise and the sound of people screaming in pain. The creature started tearing through the soldiers on the ground, killing them easily with its massive hands and jaws. My grandfather said he could hear screams coming from the men on the ground as this creature killed them one by one effortlessly. Gunfire was going off randomly and even a few grenades went off. After about 10 minutes of this carnage, this thing heads back to the outpost, jumps over the fence and goes back into the vault. This creature had this thick metal collar on it like it was being summoned back to its vault. My grandfather said that the collar was flashing red as it went back into the vault. The commander gets on the radio and tells the ground team to lock up the vault. About 30 minutes later, a helicopter comes flying over and airlifts the vault out of there. The next day, they venture out into the jungle outside of the outpost and collect the weapons of all those dead soldiers. He said they were torn apart and some looked like they went through a shredding machine. There were a few men in that outpost that knew what was going on, but he didn't. It was like they were testing this creature out there. After all, it was the perfect place to do it, as that war was fought in the jungle. He told me that he never found out what it was, but he referred to it as the demon wolf. I asked him if he thought maybe it was some type of mutant animal but he told me that he believed with everything in him that it was some sort of government-created creature designed to be a killing machine. My grandfather told me this story before he passed away last year at age 76 years old. Thanks again for reading my story. I spent a lot of time in upstate New York. There are a ton of people that I've gotten to know there. And they've led me to so many out of the way places that I wouldn't have known otherwise. I've spent time on farms and lakeside cabins. I've slept in a commune with my hippie friends. I had thought I had seen it all, but nothing prepared me for what was coming. One year, a little before Halloween, a friend invited me to escape the city for a week to avoid the craziness of the season and clear my head. I was all about it. She told me that instead of staying with her on the commune, we would be heading into the woods and camping out with nothing but tents and the stars. I remember my mother complaining about me being out in the wilderness, what she called being with the wildlife, but I figured that she just didn't understand. People from the city think there are wolves and mountain lions and bears everywhere when you walk into the woods. I just packed my bag and told my mother goodbye explaining that I have been to so many places before. This would just be another interesting experience. I wasn't the only person my friend invited, which helped. The more people, the less likely wildlife would bother us. And they say that animals are more afraid of you than you are of them. I just wanted to enjoy my time away without feeling neurotic. Being in a group of 10 instead of two would help ensure that coyotes wouldn't just walk up to us. As the first night of the trip got going, there was a guitar playing and dancing. People were gathered around the fire. Some were inebriated and some weren't. I personally had a few drinks, but nothing crazy. The fire began to die down around midnight, and all the tents in our little clearing between the trees began to fill up with tired hippies. I was getting ready to follow everyone to bed, but I had the urge to take advantage of the quiet time to sit alone by the dying fire and enjoy the breeze that passed through. Everyone said goodnight as they walked by. Shortly after, I heard rustling in the trees. I didn't think much of it. I figured it was someone who had wandered back from the woods. But when the rustling stopped and no one emerged, I took my last sip of my drink and set it down. I looked towards the spot where the rustling was coming from, and still no one. That's when I noticed these two red dots a little ways into the trees. They were lined up like eyes, but I had never in all of my travels seen any animals or people with eyes like that. 
I wanted to get a closer look. I took a few steps towards the trees. The clearing was coming to an end, and the shadows of the trees started covering me. This only made the red dots glow brighter. I looked up at the sky for a moment. There was not much light coming down because the moon was waning. When I looked back down to the trees, those eyes were gone. I stood still for a moment. Maybe I was seeing things. I didn't usually drink, so I started blaming it on the alcohol. Suddenly, I heard more rustling behind me. I heard heavy breathing coming from behind me too, and then I felt something warm and wet drip onto my neck down the back of my shirt. I froze and I didn't dare turn around. I stood there paralyzed for a few seconds. It looked like whatever was behind me was almost as tall as the tree next to me. I couldn't make out much from the shadow because of how dark it was, but I could hear it from its breathing, and it didn't sound human. I thought maybe it was a bear, but I figured that a bear would not have stayed silent and would have mauled me by now. Something was very different about this creature. I heard grunting and saw from the shadow that it was moving slowly. Then I heard it walk away, its footsteps heavy on the ground. I was still paralyzed by fear, but I wanted to know what it was and why it spared me. Surely bears and mountain lions would just attack. Slowly I turned my body in the direction of the footsteps. What I saw, I could never unsee. There was this large creature. It had to be at least eight foot tall walking across this clearing. It looked like an extremely large ape. I could make out that it had this very dark fur in the dim light of the embers from the fire. I could also see that it was very muscular. It looked like a huge, hairy bodybuilder. I stood there in awe as it walked by the tents, ignoring the people inside. But since it was walking away, I never got to see its face. There was one point as I turned my body completely around that it seemed to stop. Its hearing must have been fine-tuned. I stopped moving too. I didn't even breathe. I watched this thing as it started walking into the woods. The trees and bushes around it were rustling again. After a minute, I let myself breathe again. When it disappeared, I ran into my tent and I began sharing with my friend what I just saw. They told me it was probably a bear, but I know it wasn't a bear. I was sure I saw those eyes a few more times on that trip, but I never saw that creature again. It's strange how when I tell people what I saw, they usually fire back with an explanation. Well, it was probably this, or I think it might have been that. They all do it. They all have a suggestion of what I might have seen or what I probably saw. They never let themselves consider what I saw might actually be what I saw. It makes me laugh because they say it quickly too. Like no sooner have I said the words and they fire back with one of their theories. It's like a reflex action that they just can't help. Like their brains say, no, this challenges what we know. This can't be true and those things aren't real. I did see what I saw. I saw it as plainly as I see my hand before my face. It was solid. It was there and it was real and no attempt to explain it away is going to convince me otherwise. I had been at the fairground. They set up the rides and booths on Markham's fields about twice a year. You always know it's coming because you'll see the usual flyers plastered all over town. Anyway, I always love these local fairs and particularly the rides. I don't know about you, but there's something about the fact that a ride wasn't there a week ago and that it's been unloaded from the back of someone's truck and put together with a screwdriver and a monkey wrench that makes them 10 times scarier than the rides you get at Six Flags or Disneyland. It gives them that added element of danger that in addition to the speed and the movement of the rides, they might not have been put together all that well. Of course, you rarely hear of anyone actually being hurt on these rides, otherwise they'd be shut down, and I'm sure there's all kinds of safety checks, but still the impromptuness of the entire thing gives it that added element of danger. So last June, a few friends and I headed down to the fair. After a lot of needling, 
we manage to convince Donna, who hates these kind of rides, to go on the Kraken. The Kraken is a huge eight-arm contraption. You sit in one carriage with four other people. The ride has eight total carriages, each at the end of one of the mechanical arms, and they all get lifted into the air. The entire contraption spins and the carriages themselves spin too. There were four of us and only three spaces in one of the carriages. I let Donna and the others get into that one and I got into one by myself. Partly pleased because the carriages with less weight tend to spin faster and give you a better ride. We waved to each other and set off. Once the ride started though, and just as we were being lifted into the air, I happened to glance towards the tree line and that's when I saw it. It was standing, hunched against one of the trees and watching the crowd. I'd seen nature documentaries where you see wolves and lions standing on the edge of the brush, using trees as camouflage, and they eye up their prey. This was the same thing. This thing just wasn't watching out of curiosity. It was panning, selecting, and weighing up its next move. It was bigger than any man or ape that I had ever seen. Judging by the size of the trees, I would probably say it's somewhere between six to eight feet tall. It was standing up on its hind legs like a person, with this sort of backward lean as if the hips were different from ours. From the glimpses that I got, it seemed to be hunched and it wasn't a person. I think the best way I could describe it, it would be a cross between a dog and a man or the kind of creature you'd see in some horror films, as if the head of some massive wolf had just been put onto the shoulders of a man. It was covered from head to toe in matted brown hair, but you could tell from the way it was built that it was a powerful animal, and if it wanted to leap out and grab someone, it could. I screamed, but of course so was everyone else because of the ride. I pointed frantically at the trees trying to get someone's attention to warn them that this thing was there. But as the ride kicked into gear, I got spun around and my view was altered. Soon enough, I was facing away from the tree line, trying my best against the G-force to turn in my seat, to look back over my shoulder and see it again. All I saw were quick flashes of it, tiny snatched glimpses. By the time the ride finished, the creature was gone. I kept scanning the trees to try and see it again and to show it to the others. I tried to explain to them how it looked, how it had a canine head, a muscular body, sharp, piercing, intelligent eyes. And all I got back was a quick fire explanations as to what they thought it could have been. I saw what I saw. Sometimes, when I'm all alone at night, I still see it. I can't seem to get it out of my head. It's something that shouldn't exist, but it does. I was a special agent with the FBI for over 12 years at the time. I worked in the field and at headquarters. I've seen and heard some very strange things, but nothing that would make me question my sanity until now. We had a few people working a case in the Midwest when I was called in for backup to do surveillance of an area where suspicious activity was happening. It really didn't have anything to do with the main case we were working on, but something happened where we needed a surveillance team in place. The main team was investigating a group of individuals who were laundering money. However, some very strange things started happening during the investigation. They were laundering money through several local small businesses, and the main team was trying to find out where the money was coming from and who was giving it to them. The money started showing up in a few banks in the area, and we were able to track some of it back to a couple of businesses that were owned by one man. He had several businesses that he owned, but this particular business was an auto repair shop. We had been watching him for a while when things started happening around his property. We had a 24-hour surveillance team in place to track a few different individuals, when at night they started noticing something that wasn't natural. Now, I didn't believe this until I saw it with my own eyes. Actually, this is the reason why I was called in. 
So my partner and I were in a separate location from the main team with night vision on. We were monitoring this auto repair shop. Now this is in the Midwest. It was a small town and the auto shop was just outside of town. The property backed up to some woods and there were several trails that went through the woods. There were two large trees on either side of this driveway that went to the auto shop and it looked like one had been struck by lightning at some point. We were across the street on the other side of the property. We had parked about a half mile up the road to this old pull off spot where there was this Mexican food truck that was open during the day. A little side note, I do remember they had the most amazing buffalo chicken burritos. Anyways, my partner and I are there with our night vision on and it's about 11 p.m. at night. We are monitoring the field behind the auto shop because this is where the main team had reported something very strange going on a few nights before my partner and I flew out. From one side of the property to the other is about 200 yards. In total, it's about a three to four acre property that this auto repair shop is sitting on. On the right side of the property in the woods, I see what looks like these glowing eyes. At this point, I couldn't make out what it is. It could have been a deer, a black bear, or anything really. However, it wasn't something small like a dog or a cat. The next thing I see is this thing with these glowing eyes take off and sprint from one side of the lot to the other in about eight seconds. Now keep in mind that this field is about 200 yards wide. That's over 50 miles per hour and this thing was huge. I was tracking it from across the street. It looked like a bear sized dog with a huge head. Had to be at least 300 pounds or so. About a minute later this thing is now walking back to the other side of the field dragging a deer with its left hand. It's literally walking upright in the darkness behind the auto shop, dragging a white-tailed deer with its left hand or claw. Unbelievable. You really do have to see it to believe it because I did not believe what the main team described to me when I first arrived. Like I said, this had nothing to do with the main case, however, we needed to rule out that it wasn't related in any way. I know it sounds like a stretch, but we're dealing with a very big case of money laundering here. The next day, I contacted local law enforcement and told them about what we had witnessed and how we need to be sensitive to the ongoing investigation. I worked with them for the next month trying to track down this thing, but we only saw it one other time. We eventually ended up busting the money laundering ring, or at least that portion of it but we were never able to track down that animal again. In the first week of May 2020, I had a rather violent encounter with what I believe to be a dog man. Due to reasons that I will explain in my story, I'm not comfortable with giving my name or the details of exactly where this happened, although I am the main participant in this encounter. The experience was shared with a dozen or more people in one way or another. My hope is that one of the others that was there that night, who has more balls than I do, will hear this and be brave to come forward publicly, or at least release some of the pictures taken that night. Here we go. I'm a pretty normal guy living in the suburbs of Delaware on the border of southeastern Pennsylvania. I'm a lover of the outdoors. And in the past few years, I have not had the time to really get out in nature like I should and get my much needed dose of the natural world. In 2019, I opened up my own online business. My business struggled for the first year, but then due to the pandemic and the whole world being stuck at their home by their computers, my sales tripled the first half of 2020 and continues to blow up until this day. I have two kids who are now very responsible and trustworthy teenagers. My girlfriend is a nurse at a local hospital and is considered an essential worker. So the pandemic has kept her very busy. I turned 40 this year as well. And for the first time in my adult life, I had some time on my hands and I was itching to get away from civilization. I have an internet hotspot router built into my SUV. It works almost anywhere, no matter how remote. So with a laptop, I figured I could work from the road, take a few days to go fishing, breathe in some fresh air. 
neither of my teenagers were interested in joining me. And like I said, my girlfriend was far too busy with work. So I took my best friend with me, a 120 pound pit bull lab mix named Pete. He makes a great camping dog. He's incredibly lazy and I never have to worry about him running off to chase deer or anything like that. He will lay on his blanket next to the fire all day and all night, unless I make him head out with me. But as I have learned while camping with Pete, if coyotes, bears, or any other predators come around, he snaps out of his laziness and protects camp. Despite his easygoing demeanor, Pete is pretty intimidating, as he's 120 pounds of solid muscle with no fat which always blows my mind because of how lazy and inactive he really is. I try to go camping at least once a year, and when I do, I usually rough it with a small tent and whatever else I can carry on my back. This time, I decided I wanted to have as many comforts of home and really pamper myself, so I hitched my 10-foot enclosed cargo trailer to my very large SUV. I filled it with all the things I would want to be really comfy. I brought my full-size backyard grill, a 12x12 pop-up canopy, an air mattress, two large coolers full of food, and a fancy six-person tent. The campground I decided to go to is a large one, and it is mostly used by the RV kind of crowd. But on the far end, right next to the best fishing area, they have half a dozen or so just plain old campsites. No power or water hookups. My campsite was bordered by about 50 yards of thick woods that separated my camp from a large, fast-moving stream that is well known to be one of the best trout fishing spots in the entire state. On the other side of the stream is this steep mountainside covered in rock overhangs and small caves. It is a beautiful area and I love falling asleep to the sound of the water. I set up the camp so that my SUV trailer and pop-up canopy make sort of a U-shape and block most of the view into my area from all the rest of the campers. I rented my campsite for a full week, starting on Friday, May 1st, which was the first day the state opened up the state parks and campgrounds to the public since the pandemic shut down in March. I arrived at the campground about midday on Friday. The place was packed. I spent most of the day getting my campsite set up and getting to know my temporary neighbors, cooking ribeye steaks, burgers, and vegetables on the grill. The weather in central Pennsylvania in early May time is pretty much perfect, so I decided to sleep in the tent each night with Pete and turn my trailer into my mobile office, where I kept my computer, internet goods, mailing packages, and even a printer for printing postage. This way I could work an hour or so each morning, get my orders packed up, and drive 20 minutes to the nearest town every few days to get my orders shipped out. I remember thinking that I wish I could convince my girlfriend and kids just to sell everything and move into the woods just like this. The weekend was crazy busy at the campground, and the creek was lined with fishermen as far as the eye could see. So I decided to do some hiking and explore into the vast surrounding wilderness with Pete. Instead of fighting 10 people for the same fishing spot, it felt great to get out to where I belong, the woods. But to be honest, when you camp in Pennsylvania, you should expect to get rained on quite regularly. On the afternoon of Sunday, May 3rd, the campground cleared out fast, and by sundown there were only a few active campsites left. I had gotten to know the two guys in the campsite directly next to mine. So we hung out for a few hours every night while I drank some hot tea and they smoked joints like they were cigarettes. And needless to say, they were always hungry and seemed pleased to have me next door with my full-size grill and enough food to feed a small army. For the next few days, I worked online. I fished the creek and explored the mountains of the area on foot with my dog. We also just liked to walk around the campsite itself, stop to talk with scattered campers who were there during the weekdays. On Tuesday afternoon, a few of them told me about a black bear who had made his way into the more accessible side of the campground and even raided their campsites the night before. This had me a little concerned because I had a full-size grill just sitting out in the open at my camp and had been cooking delicious food for days on end. I debated putting the grill inside of my enclosed trailer at night, 
but sadly, laziness got the best of me and I left it out. Central Pennsylvania has a rather large black bear population. I was already aware of this, so at night I slept with a Mossberg Maverick 88, a 12 gauge shotgun loaded with buckshot in the tent with Pete, just in case a rogue bear posed a danger to us. I had forgotten to pack my Ruger Redhawk 44 Magnum for hiking. So while out in the woods, I had to rely on my Smith & Wesson Shield 45 ACP that I already had on my hip when we left home. It wasn't ideal, but I figure it was better than nothing. On the night of Tuesday, May 5th, my new friends and I cooked up some delicious barbecued chicken thighs, baked beans, and some baked potatoes wrapped in aluminum foil in my fire pit. They produced a small bottle of vodka as well and we made a few orange soda spiked drinks to go with our fancy campsite dinner. All the food and drinks combined with too much fun had us worn out a little early. So we parted ways and got ourselves prepared to crash for the night, a night that would prove to be the most terrifying night of our lives. About 10 p.m., I loaded four shells of buckshot into my shotgun, got my tent all squared away, and lied down in the tent next to my dog on his bed and blanket. I put some citizen journalist news on my phone, put one headphone in my right ear and kept my left ear clear to listen to my surroundings and to enjoy the sounds of nature. My tent was pitched close to the tree line, with the rear of the tent facing the woods. The noise of the frogs and insects at night was super loud and is kind of like a song that puts me to sleep better than any lullaby ever could. The next thing I remember is waking up, my eyes popping open to some kind of hollow metallic noise outside my campsite. I lie there perfectly still with my heart slamming from a quick spike of adrenaline, flooding all of my veins. Then a bang. I heard the lid on my grill slam shut. I had stuck a fairly bright solar-powered motion light to the side of my trailer that lit up my small U-shaped courtyard area of vehicles and tents. My tent was facing the open part of the U and I could see that my motion light was on and someone or something was moving around my camp, casting shadows as it went. I looked at Pete to my right. He was still lying down, but his head was up and his eyes were big as ping pong balls. He was clearly hearing what I was, but found it strange that he was silent. It was then when I noticed that I couldn't hear the usual deafening noise of frogs and insects in the woods behind me. Whatever it was, it was breathing. Then I heard whatever it was breathing. It sounded like a large bear. I could hear it walking around. And then I heard it at my trailer pulling at the side door trying to get inside. So I sat up and I grabbed my shotgun. One thing about black bears is that they are not the bravest animals, and any man-made noise will almost make them run for their lives. So I racked the slide of my shotgun as loud as I could and chambered a shell. Instead of running off, the creature stopped moving and went silent. I could just feel the fear building up inside of me, as I pretty much held my breath and listened. To my horror, it, whatever it was now, began walking towards my tent. It was then I saw its shadow take shape as it drew closer. It was on two feet and apparently huge. I sat there in terror and disbelief as it came right up to the front of my tent, breathing like a giant monster. I said out loud, whoever you are, I have a 12 gauge pointed right at you, so you would better sound off who you are. Right then it leaned forward right up to my tent and let out the most terrifying deep growl I've ever heard in my life. At that moment, Pete whined softly and cowered his head down. It was then that the shadow of its head was clearly visible. It had the head of a giant wolf with two pointed ears. As it was growling at me, I could hear my neighbors talking to each other. One of them shined a flashlight of the creature. When the light hit the side of the creature's face, I saw its eyes light up just like golden LED lights. It turned its face towards the flashlight and I could hear the man gasp and exclaim. Then it turned its attention back to me and growled again. 
I decided that if I didn't do something, this thing was going to kill us. So I lied back on my sleeping bag, took aim at the shadow of the monster's head, and pulled the trigger. What followed was complete and total pandemonium. The monster screamed and roared at the same time. It was like a death scream of a woman mixed with the roar of a big lion. Pete finally snapped out of his fear, jumped up, and began barking furiously. The thing ran off, and from what I could tell from the loud thump, it ran straight into my trailer. I clambered up, quickly unzipping my tent and poked my head outside to see. It got up on its feet and then ran right into the picnic table and did a flip onto the ground. It started grabbing its face and thrashing around. I could see that there was blood everywhere on the trailer. I jumped out of the tent while chambering another shell. I aimed it as best as I could with my entire body shaking violently. And right as it started to get up, I shot at it a second time. I'm not entirely sure that I hit it with the second shot. It stood straight up and I pumped the gun and shot again. The third shot dropped it again. I was so terrified and taken back by how tall it was when it stood up that I tripped over my own feet falling backwards. Just then I hear more gunfire erupting behind me, turning to see my neighbor unloading a large revolver into this werewolf looking thing that may be 20 yards away. The creature was on its side and was kind of running in circles on the ground, gurgling and spraying blood everywhere. As it was doing this death spiral on the ground, it was moving closer to me. So I tried to pump the gun again and was shaking so bad that it took three attempts before the last shell even chambered. I just pointed the shot without aiming and could see the hump on the back of its neck rip open, spraying flesh everywhere. I was really close to it at this point. The monster stopped flipping out and its limbs were twitching, while its head remained fully animated and flopping back and forth at least for another 10 seconds. I crawled quickly back away from it and tried to stand up. I realized that once I stood up, that I had been holding my breath the entire time. And when I went to get on my feet, my vision started to go black and I fell over again. My new friend ran up and grabbed my arms and began pulling me hard backwards, away from the monster. I stood up, shaking badly, and I looked at the guy with the revolver. His eyes were huge and full of terror. When I began looking around, at least five other people were showing up there with this same wild eye expression. I saw that at least three of them had come over with their guns. People were yelling, asking each other what happened, and checking to see if I was injured. I had blood on my clothes and face. It all happened so quickly, but as is often told by people facing traumatic events, it appeared like it was slow motion. My dog was still barking, going crazy, so I did my best to calm him down. When I hugged him, he was shaking as much as I was. Before long, a small crowd had formed and people were on their cell phones calling 911. After a minute or so, a few guys and I approached the thing as it lay there, still occasionally twitching. We all stood over it saying, what is that thing, over and over. Eventually, we all started saying, it's a werewolf. In disbelief, all at once, people began taking pictures with their phones. Mine was still in the tent. The wolf man was dead. The top half of its head was basically gone, including both of its eyes and the top of its snout. I assumed that it was the first shot that I made from the tent. The front of its neck was completely shredded, and the back of its neck was missing a large chunk of meat. Other than that, it was pretty much impossible to see. Other than that, it was pretty much impossible to see the other injuries it had sustained as it was completely covered from head to toe with blood. But we were all pretty sure that it had taken a buckshot or a 357 Magnum to the chest as well. There was a small river of blood running through the camp, right past my tent, from the puddle that surrounded this beast. Yeah, there was a lot of blood. It was on its side, and after a few minutes, we summoned the courage to grab some big sticks and flip it onto its back. It had these dog-like legs, these weird-shaped paws with a kind of a small heel for feet. 
Looking back, I'm impressed that it was able to balance such a big heavy body on two small feet. It had really skinny lower legs and pretty thick upper legs. It had arms pretty much like a human with long fingers that had filthy looking claws, roughly four inches long. I noticed it was missing the top half of a finger from the battle. This thing had a stench around it that was unbearable like feces or fermented dog urine. Although its head strongly resembled that of a huge dog, the teeth did not. Its upper and lower jaws supported nothing but interlocking sharp teeth, like those of a crocodile. No sharp molars in the rear of its mouth like normal dogs have. Then the second wave of terror hit us all at once. The howling and multiple creatures sounded off in the direction of the mountain just behind the creek. That's when my blood ran cold and I could see the same big-eyed look go over everybody's face. We all knew exactly what it was. We also knew that it meant we might be in big trouble. I ran to my tent and clumsily loaded my shotgun full of five rounds and grabbed my 45 as well, clipped it to my side inside my waistband, also grabbing my phone. All of a sudden, everyone was done looking at the werewolf and was looking at each other and into the woods in the direction that the howling came from. The numerous howls kept up for a few minutes and to our relief seemed to be getting further and further away. The police, game wardens, and paramedics all showed up at once. I could see from the flashing lights that they had blocked the entrance to the campground up the hill off in the distance. The cops were just as surprised and freaked out as we were when they first saw the creature. The two game wardens looked worried and not surprised. They told everyone not to take any pictures and made everybody clear the general area. The wardens were both on their phones almost the whole times from then on. The paramedics cleared everyone and tried to get me to agree to go to the hospital to get checked out. I refused. The only injury that I had was to my hearing, as I was now half deaf for a few days from all the gunfire and noise. The paramedics were also very silent, looking worried much like the game wardens, like they knew something. The police took my shotgun and the revolver from my neighbor. They let me keep my 45. They made everyone else put their guns away, and anyone who was there was rounded up for questioning. Everybody was told to stay off their phones, which wasn't much of a problem as only a few people's phones ever got any signal anyway at that campground. When I asked the game warden what was going on, what that thing was, they told me they did not know, but that it looks like some kind of mutated bear or large unknown canine. A few hours later, an SUV fully black loaded with guys showed up. They were all carrying large glocks, dressed in cargo pants and t-shirts. They immediately took me and the others who were involved aside and began questioning us. They told me that they were there with the federal fish and game and they were very interested in the howling we heard after the battle occurred. They must have asked me like 10 times where it was, how close it sounded and what it sounded like. They also told me about a dozen times that I was not to tell anybody what had happened and that they would get to the bottom of things and find out what I had encountered. They told me to tell anyone who asked about my trailer that I had to shoot an aggressive black bear. I assume they told my neighbor and anybody else who was on the scene to say the same thing. They made us open our phones and go through our photos, delete the pictures we took one at a time. They also told me that if any pictures were to come out of the creature, that it would spell trouble for anybody who has them. They threatened me with all kinds of trouble if this got out. They did not try to pretend that I was seeing things. They point blank and politely asked me not to talk about it and to lie about the trailer damage. It was about 4 a.m. at this time, and the officials had already gotten to everybody in the campground, and I assume the other people were told it was a bear and made to pack up and get ready to go. They said it was not safe and they had to close the campground until they were sure it was fully safe. After the remaining pieces of the dogman were bagged and tagged, a small fire truck was brought in, and all the blood was hosed off my trailer, vehicle, the tables, and everything else. Then a few guys wiped down my trailer and vehicle with soapy water. 
Regular old duct tape was put over the holes in my trailer, and they took my tent, my bloody clothes, my bloody slippers as evidence along with my shotgun. Right before I left, they gave me back my shotgun, wiped down, and unloaded. They told me to fill my tank at the closest town and drive straight home without stopping. They were serious. They repeated this three times. Since all of this, I have learned everything that I can about what I've encountered. I listen to Dogman and Wolfman encounter stories day and night, and that is how I came across your channel. I figured it only made sense to reach out to you. I'm amazed that the authorities are able to keep such a noisy event with so many witnesses under wraps. I've been searching for anybody who came forward or anything about the campground closing in the news. Nothing. I don't even know if anybody has been silenced. Look, I'm not interested in putting myself out there to the public. And truth be told, I'm almost as scared of the agents as I am that dog man. But all in all, they seem genuinely concerned for my well-being. I have some advice for anybody who decides to camp overnight in the wilderness of Pennsylvania. Bring some decent firepower with you. Hi Donovan, let me start off by saying I encountered something very terrifying when I was on patrol this past April in Texas. It wasn't of this world and its face was half off. I was on patrol in the middle of the night. I was with my partner and we were driving along the road which goes through a sparsely populated forest. We had just passed a house and there wasn't much around us. It was very quiet. I remember looking out my window and seeing something move quickly behind the trees. It looked like it was crouching down with its head tilted to the side as if it was looking at me. I told my partner to stop so I could get out and take a look around. As soon as I got out of the car, I could see this thing crawling on the side of the road. When I shined my flashlight on it, it was in the shape of a human, but it was hairless and white as a ghost with these large black eyes. Its face was missing on one side like it had been rotted off or it was damaged in some type of accident. It wasn't human because it was much taller and thinner than any human. Its arms were disproportionately long for its body. It was making this low growling and hissing noise as it was crawling on the side of the road. Now I've seen a lot of things as an officer, but I tell you this was truly terrifying. It was so terrifying that I dropped my flashlight and ran back to the car. My partner looked at me like I was crazy, but he didn't see what I saw. He asked me what happened and I told him that there was something crawling on the side of the road. He got out of the car and he shined his flashlight on it. When he did, this thing stood up, its head tilted back as if it were looking at us. It had these large black eyes with no eyelids or eyebrows, just two black holes in its face. It made this loud hissing noise again and then started walking towards us like a zombie would in a horror movie. My partner quickly turned back to the car and we drove off as fast as we could. He barely got in the door as he was taking off. I know the dash cam and body cams got this thing on tape. When we got back to the station, we reviewed the footage, and it got all fuzzy when we encountered this thing, like the tracking is messed up on an old VCR tape. I don't know what this thing was, maybe one of your listeners has experienced something like this in the past. This happened just west of San Antonio. I worked as a police officer in a small town in rural Nebraska. Back in the 90s, I was patrolling through town in the winter. We had several abandoned houses in town, but one seemed to have the attraction of copper thieves, so we were told to keep an eye on it. I drove by it around 7 p.m. Since it sat on a corner lot, I had a clear view of all four sides of the house. As I drove around the corner, nothing looked out of the ordinary. About two hours later, I drive by again and the back door is wide open. I know that the back door was not open when I drove by earlier. Looking at the snow on the ground around the house, there were no footprints. So I think, what the hell? 
I called dispatch and tell them I'm investigating an open door at the address and ask for a county sheriff to start my way. I walk to the open door, pull out my flashlight, and shine it inside. The house has obviously been gutted for the most part. The plaster walls have been torn down, debris piles everywhere. Since there were no footprints in the snow around the door other than mine, and with all the dust on the floor not showing any footprints, I chalk it up to the wind or maybe the door just opened on its own. I was about to secure the door when I heard this loud thump coming from upstairs and what sounded like kids laughing. So I enter the house and I yell out, Police department, come downstairs. I hear more of those sounds of kids playing. I tell dispatch that it sounds like there are kids in the house and start making my way through the kitchen into the living room where the stairs are all the while cautiously checking the main floor. Two more times I hear something upstairs, but since I've had no response, I start thinking maybe it's an animal. Still, I hear what I swear was kids laughing. I head upstairs and it gets all quiet. The upstairs is relatively small with a hallway at the top of the stairs that has one bedroom on the right, one straight ahead at the end of the hall and a bedroom on the left. As I get to the top of the stairs, I hear a thump in the bedroom to the left. I carefully peek inside the door and it's an empty room with a small pile of plaster and wood debris in the middle. No kidding. Sitting on top of the pile of debris was a page torn out of a child's book with a picture of a police officer on it. The hair stood up on the back of my neck so quickly I got out of that room and quickly cleared the other rooms upstairs and got the hell out of there. I told dispatch nobody was in the house. I locked the back door and I never went back in there again. My uncle works for dispatch in my town and he recently told my family the weirdest call he's ever received. He said that he received a call from a landline one night when he answered it. There was only static on the other end. This happened two more times. Finally, he calls a squad to go check out the address from the caller ID. When the cop got there and walked into the house, they immediately saw that there was a dead body. The person had been dead for five months. The craziest part about it was that there was no electricity or other utility working. So there is no way they should have been able to get those calls into dispatch. But if they hadn't, who knows how long that body would have stayed there. I was doing security work for a hospital with the ER, ICU, and surgical, the whole works. And I got called to several paranormal calls. Most were psych cases or paranoid people that heard a strange noise. This time, more than one nurse saw a guy on camera who was on his desk bed. A guy who kept saying earlier that day, I will not die in a hospital. He literally pushes his curtain aside and walks out of his room towards the elevator. A code was called and everybody immediately posted at their designated locations. Within seconds, there were people watching the elevators and the stairs, and security started combing the area and investigating. As I reached the ICU floor, I spoke with the lead nurse and she told me that several of the nurses saw him leave. At that moment, monitors started going off. The guy never left. The guy went code blue and died right then. There were three witnesses on the report that say he got up and left and were serious enough to call a code which could cost them their jobs if they were wrong. The bosses wouldn't let us watch the video but the looks on their faces said it all. The bosses said that the nurses did the right thing, and some things just can't be explained. The portion of the video I was allowed to see showed that nobody had left via an elevator or stairs. My uncle was the sheriff of a small town in New Mexico. He was the most hardcore person in our family, super straight-laced, and wasn't at all a joker in any way. When he told this story, which was backed up by my aunt, we believed it without question. There was this local reporter named Bob D. 
he would always show up at any major police activity from a police scanner, anything worth reporting in the local paper. Everybody on the force knew Bob. He was around at least once or twice a week at various police activities. Bob was a bit of a joker himself. He would mess with people by flicking them behind the ears. People would react to the flicks thinking that it was a bug only to turn around to see it was Bob jerking around. Everybody liked Bob though. Unfortunately, Bob had stage 4 lung cancer and died pretty suddenly. His wife buried him against his wishes. He wanted to be cremated. For the next couple of weeks after his funeral, people kept talking about seeing Bob at a car wreck, fires, and all the same stuff that he used to report on. There were 20 or 30 reports like this from civilians and members of the force alike. My uncle didn't buy it though, until the night he and my aunt showed up at our house, gun drawn, pale as paper. We asked him what happened, and he had to sit down and take his breath, compose himself, and start to outline what had happened. This is a guy who I had never seen get rattled by anything. He said my aunt and him were sitting on the couch in their house watching TV. My uncle kept scratching his ear over and over. Finally, my aunt asked him what was the problem, and he turned around just in time to see their bedroom door open. Bob D. was standing in the doorway clear as day. My uncle jumped up, cussed or something, and got my aunt's attention, who turned to see him there too. As soon as they both made eye contact with him, Bob just smiled, turned, and walked across the living room and out their front door. He closed the door behind himself and was gone. My uncle got control of himself and ran outside, gun drawn looking for Bob, but he was gone. At that point, they just ran over to our place. We went over there, but we didn't see anything, and my aunt and uncle stayed at our place for the rest of the night. The next day, all the guys on the force were giving my uncle lots of, we told you so. People around town said that they saw Bob show up at police scenes for at least another two to three months. My dad even saw him in our dark room in our basement with a friend. He was flicking their ears in the dark. Three months after he was gone, people continued to see him and kept saying he was looking worse and worse. My uncle saw him two more times, each time confirming he was looking more and more worn out. My dad had concluded that he was decomposing and his ghost was reflecting that process. Every time my ear itches, I get goosebumps now. Police officer here. One evening about eight years ago, it was pouring outside and we got a call from an elderly woman. She called in and she said that she was hearing footsteps inside of her house. She thought there was a ghost inside because she regularly heard the sound of someone walking upstairs, but she lived alone. We went to check it out and to make sure everything was okay. She stayed on the line with the 911 operator because she was frightened. About three minutes after she initially called in, she said that there was actually a man standing outside in her backyard staring at her through her sliding glass door. Petrified, the woman froze in that spot and continued to stare directly at the man. For the next minute or two, she said he was just standing there as still as could be staring at her. Eventually, the man slunk off out of sight. When we arrived about 12 minutes after the call first came in, we went to the front door. I remained in the foyer with the woman and the other officer went to the backyard to see if the man was still hiding out or if there was any traces of him. I spoke with her for several minutes until the other officer returned. He said there was no trace of anyone having been in the backyard. We set off to do a quick sweep before we left the house to make sure the house is all clear. In her living room, the room that has the sliding glass door, we discovered a trail of mud and footprints inside the house. I asked the woman if she had been outside at all that day, or if anyone had been over to visit. She said no, that she lived alone, and that no one came by to visit. The woman was probably around 85, and she had pretty poor eyesight and was hard of hearing. The woman obviously had seen the man's reflection, 
and mistakenly thought he was in front of her on the other side of the glass door in her backyard. But in reality, he had been standing only a few feet behind her in the same room while she had been talking to 911. Nothing was stolen, broken, or out of place, so we don't know what his intentions were. Who knows what would have happened had she not stayed on the line with the operator. I'm a security patrol officer in Scottsdale, Arizona. I typically work the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. I have the largest security beat in the Scottsdale desert, and part of my job is to respond to alarm calls in these isolated mansions throughout Scottsdale, Cave Creek, and Carefree. One night, I got an alarm call at a small airport where the rich play with their airplanes. Sky Ranch Airport, to be exact. Part of the airport are residential homes with built-in hangars, and that's where the alarm was tripped at 2.30 a.m. On arrival, I went through the normal alarm process, called dispatch to make a call to the homeowners, which is vacant, so no one should be there. After the call is made, I knock on the front door very aggressively just to make sure if someone is home, they'll hear me before I make an entry. I've walked in on homeowners before at a different house. Anyway, as I walked towards the front door, I heard a little shuffling noise behind the door, very faint but loud enough to be noticed. That being the case, I rang the doorbell and knocked on the door longer than usual, and nothing. So I then began the perimeter check and I found that the back sliding door handle was broken, but there was a little note on the inside that read, handle is broken, realtor. The realtor placed a metal rod down to keep the sliding glass door from opening. I finished the perimeter check, called dispatch to let them know I was going to make an entry. The house was beautiful and everything was fine. So I wrote on my entry slip and was resetting the alarm, but a fault showed on the display that read zone 35 back room door. At that very moment, my supervisor called me via radio and asked if I knew anything about the house I was in. What he told me more than anything just annoyed me. He said back in 2008, the previous homeowner committed suicide by the front door with a shotgun when the economy crashed and left behind a wife and three kids. I knew he was trying to scare me so I brushed it off and resumed my business. I walked to the back sliding door and lo and behold, the metal rod was removed and the sliding glass door was open about four inches. That alone was creepy. The house has motion sensors, including sensors on the door itself, and none of them were showing up as faulted. I put the rod back into its original place and armed the system. A few months later, I had an alarm call at a different house, and this time the Scottsdale police assisted me. After the call was over and done with, we stood outside the home BSing, and I asked the police if they knew about the house in Sky Ranch Airport. One of the officers said he was one of the first police officers on the scene shortly after the homeowner committed suicide. They confirmed the suicide, and if I ever respond to that house again, I'll make sure I ask for backup. Hi Donovan, this happened a few years ago when I was on patrol at Yosemite National Park. I was on a two-person patrol in the back country of the park, where we were responsible for patrolling a large area and responding to any emergencies. It was just before sunrise, so it was still pretty dark outside. We had been out all night and were heading back to the ranger station in my truck when my partner said he needed to take a leak. We pulled off the road onto this wide spot with some trees and got out of the truck. My partner said he'd be right back, so I decided to stand outside. As I stood there looking around, I heard this growl coming from about 50 to 75 yards away down a hillside. It was pretty dark out and I thought it was probably a mountain lion. I had heard that sound many times before while out on patrol. I stood there for another minute then my partner finally came back from behind the truck and he said, sounds like a mountain lion and it sounds close. We both get back into the truck when we see something take off across the road. It happened so fast it was like a blur, 
but whatever it was that ran across the road was huge and had dark brown fur. We sat there for another minute trying to figure out what it was. Now keep in mind that the sun hadn't come up yet so it was still kind of hard to see, but we did see something go across the road and we could make out that it was large and it had dark brown fur. As we're sitting there, we hear this faint crying noise coming from the hillside below us. It sounded like a baby crying. My partner and I got out of the truck with our flashlights and we started going towards this sound. As we go down the hillside, the crying gets louder and louder. When we finally get to where the crying is coming from, sure enough, there is a baby there. But it's not a human baby. Well, this is where the story gets weird. This thing is like a cross between a human and a wolf. At the moment, I'm beside myself and kind of in shock, standing there, looking at what seems to be some type of werewolf creature in front of me. The mother must have been what we saw at the top of the road. My partner picks it up and starts walking up the hill. I said, wait, are you sure that is the right move? Because we just saw that run across the road and it looked huge. It could come back at any second. He said, we can't leave this baby out here by itself. So we head back up the hill and get into the truck and take the baby back to the ranger station. This thing is making all kinds of weird noises and opening its mouth like it's hungry. It didn't have a full set of teeth, but it had well-developed canines in its front teeth. The morning shift came in about an hour after we got back to the station, and my boss said he was going to make some phone calls and he will take care of it. My partner and I went home for the day, but I thought about that little creature until my shift that night. Fast forward to that night when I came back into work, I asked around to some other rangers what happened to that baby that we brought in. They said, what baby? I told them what had happened and they kind of chuckled saying, yeah right. So I sent my boss a text asking what happened. He said it's taken care of and that's the end of it. And don't mention this to anybody else. I pried again saying, what do you mean? What happened to that baby? He said, if you want to keep your job, then you need to keep this to yourself and not ask any questions. It has been handled and we need to shut down that area of the park for the next 14 days. So that was the end of it. I've never heard anything since. I left there last year and it's still a mystery to me what this thing was. But whatever it was, they don't want us to know, that is for sure. Hi Donovan, this happened just last week, so the story is still developing. I've been a park ranger for the last 12 years. I've worked in several different parks, but the majority of my time has been spent in one particular park. The park is surrounded by thousands of acres of undeveloped land, and there are only two roads that enter the park. Both are gravel and not maintained during the winter months. The nearest town is about 15 miles away, and it's very hard to get cell phone service out here. I've had many odd experiences working here, but this one takes the cake. I received a call from another ranger who was patrolling one of our backcountry campsites. He said that he found a campsite that was in complete disarray and there were signs of a struggle. He asked me to come out and take a look at the site. I arrived about 15 minutes later and walked into the camp area with him. The first thing I noticed was the tent was halfway knocked over, but it appeared as if somebody had done it intentionally because half the stakes were pulled out of the ground. There were also large drag marks leading from the tent to an old fire pit where someone had dug up some charcoal and scattered it around. The second thing I noticed was that there were several pieces of broken glass spread out through the campsite which is unusual for this park because we don't allow glass containers of any kind on our backcountry sites. We have bears and other wildlife in this park, so we don't want people leaving behind anything that could potentially harm them or their food supply. I went through the tent looking for any signs of who may have been staying there, when I came across a sleeping bag that had blood on it, and I mean a lot of blood, and the tent smelled horrible like rotted garbage. At this point, my heart started racing because I knew something serious had happened here. 
but I still didn't know exactly what took place or who may have been involved. I called local law enforcement, and about 20 minutes later, two sheriff deputies pull into the campsite, along with the state trooper who patrols this area regularly due to its remote location. They went through the campsite and looked into the tent and found the blood-stained sleeping bag. They took pictures of everything and marked off the area so no one would come in and disturb anything. The sheriff's deputies had to put on masks because the smell was so strong inside of the tent. After they were done, I was able to talk to them about what had happened. They told me it looked like somebody was beaten and drugged outside the tent and into the woods. They found signs of a struggle and some large clumps of reddish brown fur. It was much larger than the fur of a bear. Search and Rescue is actively searching for this man. I'm praying that we find him. Hi Donovan, this happened last fall in southern Florida. I was driving down the road when out of nowhere a man runs in front of my patrol car. I didn't have time to stop so I hit him at 40 miles per hour. As soon as I hit him his body flew into the air and landed on the top of my car. It sounded like an explosion had gone off inside my car and the windshield shattered from the impact. The man's body slid off my hood and fell onto the ground with a thud. I jumped out of my car and ran over to where he landed. His head had hit a rock that was sticking up from the ground, so there was blood everywhere. There were shards of glass stuck in his face, arms, legs, and chest, and he wasn't moving at all. I called for help on my radio while I checked for signs of life. When I touched his neck to feel a pulse, he was dead. No heartbeat, and he wasn't breathing. While I was on my radio looking at him, his head snapped up towards me with a look of pure rage on his face. He grabbed onto me with both hands and pulled me towards him until we were nose to nose. His eyes were glowing like red fireballs. He started screaming at me in some language that I've never heard before. It sounded like somebody was torturing animals right next to your ear. Then he bit down hard into my shoulder with his teeth. They felt like they were made out of steel or something because they cut right through my uniform shirt like it wasn't even there. I screamed at him to let go because it hurt like hell. But he kept biting harder into me until all that came out were gurgling sounds from deep within his throat. As soon as he stopped biting me, he let go and stood up straight again like nothing had happened. I grabbed my gun from its holster and pointed it at him. I told him to get on the ground, but he just stood there staring at me with those red eyes of his. He still had glass shards all over his face. I told him to get on the ground and then he bends over and grabs a large rock and throws it at me. I didn't have time to dodge it and it hits me in the chest knocking me down. He threw it with such force. I aimed my weapon at him and pulled the trigger, shooting him in the chest three times. He didn't even flinch. The bullets went right through his chest without doing any damage. Blood was spraying everywhere, but he kept walking towards me like nothing happened. I emptied my entire clip into him, but he still kept coming towards me until the ambulance arrives. I could hear the sirens that made him turn away and start running into the woods. They started treating my bite wounds while I tried to explain what had happened. The guy died on impact with my car, so how could he still be walking around? It all happened so fast, it's like time slowed down or something when he came towards me. I could see every detail of his face and everything around us was crystal clear. It felt like an eternity before he let go of my shoulder and stood up straight again. The ambulance took me to the hospital where they treated me for my wounds and gave me some painkillers for the bite marks on my shoulder. When I got home later, there were bite marks all over my shoulder and neck from him. My wife freaked out when she saw them all over. We had a team of police searching the woods for five hours looking for this man. There were no signs of him anywhere. I can't explain what or who this thing was. Do you have any ideas? Hi Donovan, I'm a police officer in the city of Detroit. I've been with the police department for about five years now, 
and I've seen some crazy things, but nothing like what happened to me last month. It was 2.30 a.m. when my partner and I were patrolling our normal beat. We were driving down a residential street when all of a sudden my partner says, what the hell is that? I look over and I see this bright light in the sky. It was hovering above the tree line. I pulled over to get a better look. My partner and I both get out of the car and start walking towards where we see this light. As we walk closer to it, we could hear this high-pitched noise coming from it. It sounded like something was screaming, but no words were being said. We looked at each other because neither one of us had ever heard anything like that before. We kept walking towards it until it reached the edge of the woods where we saw what looked like a huge craft with lights on all sides hovering about a hundred feet off the ground. We stood there for about five minutes just watching this thing hover above us making that screaming noise until finally my partner says let's go back to the car and call this in. That's the last thing I remember. I woke up on the ground next to my partner and it was 6 a.m. I tried to shake him awake but he was still out cold. I looked at him and he had this huge gash on his forehead and there was dried blood all over his face. I continued to try to wake him up but he just wouldn't wake up. So I got back to the car and called dispatch immediately. They told me that they had other reports of people seeing this thing in different parts of the city. They also send an ambulance for my partner. We both ended up at the hospital where they ran some tests on us. We were there for about six hours before they let us go home. My partner was eventually okay. We took a few days of leave and went into work the next week. But our captain tells us that we're being put on desk duty until further notice because of what had happened. He said that nobody knows what it is or where it came from. We haven't been allowed back on patrol since then, which has been about three weeks now. So I don't know if anybody else has seen this thing since then, or if anybody knows anything more about what's going on than we do right now. Hi Donovan. Believe it or not, I just subscribed to your channel a few weeks ago. I was actually listening to one of your longer episodes when this happened. So last week I visited a friend of mine who lives in Texas. I was driving to his house and it was about 4 p.m. when I left my house. His house was about 6 hours from mine. So this happened at night around 9 p.m. when I was about an hour away from his house. It was a very clear night with no clouds in the sky. As I got closer to my friend's house, I noticed that there were some trees on the side of the road that had been recently cut down. The trees were still laying on the ground so there wasn't much room for cars to pass through without getting close to them. There was also a creek on that side of the road and a large field on the other side of the road. The field was surrounded by woods but not as thick as they were further back from the road. I drove past the trees and then slowed down just because there wasn't that much room. As soon as I passed the trees, something jumped out in the middle of the road. It was a tall, dark figure standing, facing away from me. Whatever it was, it was huge. I thought it was a person at first, but my headlights stopped working as soon as it jumped out in front of me. They just completely died. I didn't know if something had happened with my car or if this thing was doing something to me. I tried to turn my lights on again, but they didn't work. My car radio started making all these weird noises and my cell phone was all scrambled and pixelated. All of these things were happening within seconds of each other, so there wasn't much time for me to react or think about what might be going on around me. The next thing that happened is this tall figure turned around and stared at me right in my car. There was enough moonlight that I could see the outline of this figure, but I couldn't make out any features. At this point, I just floored it and went straight towards this thing. I was so scared that I didn't know what else to do. I don't remember anything else until I woke up in my car. The first thing I noticed was that the sun was coming up and it was about 6 a.m. My car had stopped running and was parked on the side of the road. I tried to start my car, but it wouldn't start. It just kept turning over, but never did start. After a few minutes of trying this, I got out my USB jumper kit that I got on Amazon, 
thank God I got that thing. I was able to jumpstart my car and I drove the next one hour to my friend's house. After I got my cell phone plugged in and charged, because it was completely dead, I saw that my friend had texted me 20 times and called me about a half a dozen times. I finally called him and told him what had happened. I had a screaming headache too. I'm not sure what happened that night, but I just completely blacked out after I saw that thing. What do you think this could have been? There was no damage to my car. It seemed to have some type of electrical interference or something. Anyways, I think I'll be staying out of Texas for a while. I'm a personal assistant in Waco, Texas. It is a great place to live, and if you're looking for some awesome weather and outdoor adventure, this is definitely a good place to be. The day that this happened, I was planning to do just that, head out for a hike after work. I just got done meeting with a few clients and my day ended a bit early, so I completely called it a day. I was planning to meet my friend Susan at a nearby trailhead and we were going to do a late afternoon hike. I went back to my office and changed my clothes and called her to let her know I was ready when she was. It would take us both about 20 minutes to get to the park, and when I got there she was already there waiting for me in the parking lot. We walked our normal loop through the park, starting off on one of our favorite trails. As I look back on it in retrospect, I remember that something didn't seem right that day. But at the time, I just pushed those thoughts out of my head and distracted myself by talking to her. She and I were in deep conversation. At one point, we stopped and looked at each other as this crazy noise cut through the air. It was a noise unlike anything either of us have ever heard before. We stood there listening for a few minutes, but when it didn't happen again, we continued on. We eventually ended up at a nice clearing and stopped to have a bite to eat. We made sure to take the trash out with us as to not litter in the area, but it always did make me nervous that opening food could attract animals to us. We continued our walk and everything was still and quiet which was really peaceful at the time. Looking back, there were no forest sounds at all at this point, which now, knowing what I know, kind of makes sense. From there we hiked a bit further but made sure we didn't stay too long as it was getting close to sunset and it would be easy to get lost in this area of the park after nightfall. We started heading back towards our car, and that's when we heard this shrill scream again. But just like before, it didn't repeat itself. Even still, the sound it made made me nervous and we picked up our pace and continued to head back the way we came. It was now dusk and Susan pointed out what she thought might be an eagle's nest high above the trees. Luckily, I had my zoom lens with me so we could get a closer look. And sure enough, it was. She was really into looking at it, but I was still feeling creeped out by the screams that we heard, and told her I wanted to keep moving along back towards the car. So then, as we headed back, we began to smell something really foul coming from the path ahead of us. She said it was probably just a skunk, but this didn't smell like a skunk to me. It was a really foul odor. I was thinking it might be a fox, a deer, or even a coyote carcass. We made a left turn at the fork in the path when we spotted a huge dead tree. That was our landmarker that we were close and on the final path that would take us back to our cars. And this is when I really noticed that something wasn't right. I felt a change in the air and all of the movement in the forest stopped and it got quiet. Susan also noticed it and even made a mention of how the air seemed to change. Now my brain was getting all frazzled and I kept thinking of the horror stories in my head. We literally started jogging at this point and reached a clearing in the woods when we heard more sounds. They were so loud and so obvious with all the other silence in the woods. But these noises sounded like branches snapping off of trees as if they were being pushed over by something coming closer to us. And that's when I saw it. Well, we both saw it. The creature stood so tall at least a foot or two taller than us, and had this pale white skin all over its body. It had these huge black eyes that looked like someone ripped its eyeballs out of its socket, and it had this really wide mouth. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I couldn't understand what I was seeing. Susan grabbed me and pulled me behind a tree to hide, 
but it was too late. The creature had seen us and began coming towards us, but in this zombie-like stumbling way. Luckily, Susan always carries mace with her, and she aimed it and sprayed it towards this creature. It startled the creature, which reared up its head and let out this shrill scream, the exact scream that we heard before. I was completely frozen in my tracks. I was sure we were about to be attacked, but before I could say or do anything, it turned off the path and fled into the woods. Susan and I were speechless. All we could do was look at each other until she yelled run and we both bolted to our cars. We both later agreed that we feel we had been lucky to escape with our lives. I was never a believer in monsters before, but this changed me completely. That experience happened several years ago, and it still haunts me to this day. Susan and I still go hiking, but we haven't been back to that area since the incident. She now actually carries a pistol, and we never go hiking close to dusk or dawn. A few months back, I bought myself a drone. I'm a videographer for sporting events and weddings and birthdays, anything of that nature. I figured I could use the drone footage in various videos that I made for everybody. I even got my drone license, which you need if you're going to use the footage for commercial use. I started going around the town and got footage of the neighborhood around my house. I got office buildings and local schools, whatever I could get. Plus, it was also good practice to get an idea how to use it, how far it can go and all that. The idea of getting all the footage was so I could have some footage ready for whatever assignment I might need it for. And I always love those big epic shots you see in the movies. One of my friends suggested flying the drone from a trail you can drive along with your car. The trail has a beautiful panoramic view of the city. I agreed that that would be the perfect place to get some footage. The GoPro I had at the time recorded pretty well at night, so I was planning on getting some night shots as well. One weekend, she and I headed up there to get the shots. We were there from about 3 p.m. until it got dark. I had an app on my phone that streamed the drone's footage. That way I could see what was happening and maneuver it better. My friend would hold up the phone and I would handle the drone but I did let her fly it around a little bit to get acquainted with it. It had gotten dark and my friend was handling the drone while I was holding the phone so she could see where she was going. We were talking about how to best maneuver it when she squinted her eyes and said she could see someone in the tree line far below us. I looked at the phone and was surprised to see she was right. It looked like a man wandering off the trail. We looked at each other and wondered what he was doing down there. From what we could tell, he was huge. In those days, you couldn't go too far with my drone without losing its signal, so she didn't try to go out too far to get a better look. I asked her for the drone remote, but by the time I grabbed it, the figure was gone. We started making up random stories to explain why that guy was out there. Maybe he was a hermit, or maybe he was lost, or someone living in the woods. We made plans to go out again the next weekend to get more footage of the mountain and some shots of the town, whatever interesting angles we could get. A part of me hoped that we would see that huge guy again. I wanted to see what he was up to. The next weekend rolled around and we headed to the trail again. This time we went a little further along the trail to get a better view of the woods below. It was the same time of day as last week. And sure enough, about an hour after it got dark, we saw that strange figure again. We had a bit more range in the drone this time, so we began to track his path. Whenever he started to get out of range, we would drive a little bit further along the trail. We followed him all the way to a dead end. My friend asked if we could bring the drone closer to the man. I figured, why not give it a shot? I had it hover and move slowly along the tree line below. At this point, we had lost sight of him. After about 10 minutes of searching, we found him again. He was hunched over, deeply involved in something on the ground. The picture quality wasn't the best, but he looked like he was naked. The drone hovered around him a bit. He didn't move or anything, and I tried to get a bit closer when he suddenly flinched and stood up. That's when I realized we were not looking at a human. This creature was way bigger than we previously thought. 
He stared down at the camera as it hovered below his head. It was pretty dark, but the feed on my phone showed something sort of like an ape, but built more like this massive weightlifter or bodybuilder. It was totally covered in hair. The more my friend and I looked at it, the more we were convinced that it wasn't a man. This thing grabbed a nearby rock and threw it at the drone with such force that it brought it down. When it hit the forest floor, the feed cut out completely. We heard a scream. Not a human scream, but more of a primal sound, like the sound you would hear from an ape, along with these stomping noises. Next we heard the sound of footsteps, like heavy thuds, then they quickly disappeared. I had no intention of heading into the woods in the dark, especially knowing that this thing was out there. We decided instead to head home and try to retrieve the drone the next day when it was light. The next day we returned and while hiking through the woods, there was an awful smell in the air. It was distant but distinct. After some time, we did find the drone which had been completely destroyed. The SD card was broken and every part of it was smashed to bits. I'm sure that no one would have believed what we saw anyway, even if we had footage of it. The footage we did have was pretty grainy. So we never saw the animal clearly, but we could tell that it was unlike any other animal that we've ever seen. If we felt our footage was proof of a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, most people would have written it off as a man or even a mutant forest animal. I've thought the same thing, but the sounds we heard were not sounds humans could easily replicate. We never bothered telling people about it, but we knew what we saw, a huge hairy figure that towered even among the trees. It was definitely not a man, but trying to tell anyone that, most people would assume that what we saw was a bear and that our eyes had played tricks on us thinking it was larger than it really was. But what really convinced us was when we found the drone. The drone had been completely smashed into the dirt. All around it were footprints, huge footprints. The prints were similar to a man's but longer and wider than any foot I've ever seen. We know what we saw. Since that day, I've been saving up my money, hoping that that creature didn't take off to another forest, hoping that maybe, just maybe, I will get some clear footage of it someday. Hi, Donovan. I'm a cop in the state of Oklahoma. I've been a cop for about 10 years, and I'm not gonna tell you my name or exactly where I work for obvious reasons. I was working the night shift, which is from 3 p.m. till 11 p.m. It was about 9.30 p.m. and I was driving down a road that is heavily wooded on both sides. The trees are very tall and thick, so it's hard to see through them at night. There's no street lights in this area because it's a pretty rural area. As I approached this intersection, I saw something standing in the middle of the road about 50 yards ahead of me. Since there were no street lights and it was very dark out there, and all I could see was something standing in the middle of the road with its arms stretched out like it was trying to stop traffic or something. As I got closer to this thing, I realized that it wasn't human. It had long black hair covering its body and its face looked like a wolf's face with big pointed ears sticking up from its head. It stood upright on two legs like a man, but it had these huge feet and hands with claws on them. It also had a very muscular upper body. This thing surprised me so much that I slammed on my brakes and stopped right in the middle of the road. I sat there for a few seconds trying to figure out what it was, but I had never seen anything like that before. As I sat there, it turned around and looked right at me. It seemed to be surprised that I had stopped because it took a couple steps towards my patrol car as if it was going to come after me. That's when I realized that this thing didn't want me to see it. But there was not much I could do at this point because I'm sitting there in the middle of the road and it's walking towards my car. I got out of my patrol car and drew my weapon. I shot it three times, twice in the chest and once in the head. I only grazed its head though, but my shots were dead center on this thing's chest. It lets out this very strange and odd yell like it's screaming, but sucking air at the same time. 
then it takes off running into the woods. It started running on its hind legs, but after a few strides, it got down on all fours. I could see it stumbling into the woods. I knew I injured it badly. I could see a blood trail leading from the road to the woods, but I wasn't about to go after it in those thick woods. I radioed in for backup and explained the situation. Boy, that was a weird conversation with dispatch. They sent a team out to look for this thing. After I went back to the station to process some paperwork, my shift ended and I drove home for that night. I can tell you that I was wired when I got home. Obviously, I've never been in a situation like that before, and I just kept replaying the entire incident in my head over and over again. It was about 3 a.m. before I finally went to sleep that night. I was thinking about it so much before I went to bed that I actually had a dream about it too. Only in my dream, I shot at it and it kept coming towards me. Then with one of its claws, it swiped across my chest and made this huge gash. I was bleeding out really bad and I felt like I was going to die and then I woke up. So the next day I wake up around noon because I didn't get to sleep until so late that night. It was actually the morning. As I was getting ready for work, I texted one of my friends who was on the team that went out to try to retrieve this thing. I asked him, did you guys retrieve that wolf? There was no answer. After an hour goes by, still no answer. I thought it was a little odd because he always answers me back. Now he works the graveyard shift, but he's typically up by 2 p.m. every day because we text all of the time. So later that day I went into work and I was following up with one of my fellow officers and he told me that they recovered this thing and halfway through the FBI came in and took the creature off site. Now he wasn't on the team that my buddy was that recovered the animal but he told me that it was some type of large wolf that was domesticated. The team that went out and recovered the animal was also debriefed. They were instructed not to discuss the details related to this thing to anyone. Sure enough, as I'm walking down the hall, my boss pulls me into his office and said, I have a 3.30 meeting with someone from the FBI. It's 3.15 and I can see in one of our conference rooms a few men dressed in suits talking to the chief of police. When he exits, they signal for me to come over and then they start asking me what happened last night why I fired my weapon, what did I see, what time did it occur, basically every little detail we went over and over and over. They told me the same thing that it was some large wolf that somebody was keeping as a pet in the area. They also told me not to discuss this with anyone and that they would be handling any press or media going forward. Obviously, I knew this wasn't just some wolf that somebody kept as a pet. This thing was massive, and I mean massive. It stood upright like a human does. Wolves don't have claws like this thing had, and they don't look like a silverback gorilla in the upper body. But something told me I should just go along with what they were saying, politely agree, and move on with my business. So after my discussion with them, I finally got a text back from my friend, and he said, did you have your meeting? I responded, yes, do you want to go get some coffee later? He named the location of our usual spot and the time, and shortly after, we met up for some coffee around 5 p.m. I asked him, what is going on? What exactly is that thing? He said that it took five of them to haul it out of the woods, and it had to be at least 400 pounds. He went on to tell me that someone called somebody at the FBI because they arrived halfway through the extract and took over. They loaded this creature into a black van and that's the last that he saw of it. This entire thing was so surreal, I couldn't believe it was happening in my small town. It just goes to show you that you never really know what's going on out there. Hi Donovan, I work in law enforcement in the state of Wyoming. I've been on the job for over 15 years and have seen a lot of things. I was working as a patrol officer in the middle of Wyoming when I got the call about a possible domestic disturbance in an old farmhouse. 
it was called in by a nearby neighbor that some commotion and screaming was going on at the farmhouse. When we arrived, there were no cars in the driveway or around the property, so we assumed that it was just another false report. We knocked on the door and rang on the doorbell, but nobody answered. We decided to go around back to see if anybody was out there. As we walked around back, I noticed that all of the windows were covered with newspaper and tape, like someone didn't want any light getting inside or anyone looking in. We went to walk up to one of the windows when something caught our eye near one of the trees that lined up against one side of the house. There was what looked like a mannequin hanging from one of its arms from a tree branch, about 10 feet off the ground but it looked different than any other mannequin that I've seen before. It had long black hair, it was painted white for its skin, and had very red eyes. This mannequin also had fangs mounted on its mouth. It looked like it was wearing a black dress with white lace around the bottom of it. My partner and I both looked at each other and said, what the hell is that? My partner said, I don't know, but it sure is freaky. We went up to the window and could see through a small sliver through the newspaper that was covering up the window. When I looked in that window, I saw about 10 mannequins positioned all over the family room in odd poses wearing these crazy outfits and they all had fangs mounted to their mouths and their eyes were painted red. My first thought was what type of serial killer are we dealing with here? We couldn't really do anything because it's not against the law to have weird mannequins dressed up in your family room, but it sure was weird. We had to leave the scene after we tried knocking a few more times. We never heard anything coming from the inside. I'm sure whoever was there probably had video cameras on the outside of the house and we just didn't see any. About two weeks later, we come to find out that the feds were tracking this guy and charged him with human trafficking and murder. He would kidnap people off the street and bring them to his farmhouse and torture them for days. He would then sell them or murder them. He was doing this for years and nobody knew. The guy was a real freak. I've never seen anything like that before. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I can still see those mannequin red eyes in my mind to this day. I had a good friend who did really well for himself. He lived on a huge ranch near the mountains of Wyoming. There's a lot of wildlife in that area. Deer, bear, that kind of thing. One year he needed to go on a trip out of the country for a couple of weeks and needed someone to watch over his house, water the plants and take care of his two cats. I decided I would be crazy if I passed up the opportunity to stay in such a beautiful house stocked with food and an amazing view overlooking the town we both grew up in. This was the summer of 2014, and even though I was in college, I didn't have any classes that semester, and I didn't have much going on, so I figured I'd sleep over and watch the house while staying in one of the guest rooms. The first couple of days were pretty calm just feeding the cats and making sure everything was locked. I'd sometimes invite some other of our friends over to hang out and swim in the pool and play ping pong. I was mindful not to keep any doors open since the house was in the woods. Bears would often show up in his backyard, but as long as you yelled or waved your arms around, they were normally frightened off. One night, I was in my room and I was watching television. I kept the window open to let some cool fresh air in when suddenly an awful smell entered the room. One of the cats was on the bed with me, so naturally I started looking around to see if maybe it threw up or maybe it peed or pooped. But I didn't see anything and actually the cat had lifted its head up too and was sniffing the air. I didn't find anything out of the ordinary in the room. That's when I went to the window to look out to see what might be out there. Maybe a skunk but all was fine, at least from what I could tell, because it was basically pitch black on that side of the house. I started to call out for the other cat, but nothing. When I started thinking about it, I hadn't really seen him all day. I closed the window so that the cat on the bed wouldn't get out and looked for the other cat. 
When I left the room, I could hear something, really faint. It sounded like scratching or a rubbing sound. Now mind you, this house has seven rooms upstairs and four bathrooms. I checked each and every one of them and headed downstairs calling for the missing cat. I saw that his food bowl was empty, so he was definitely in the house, but he wasn't in the kitchen. Just then, a faint flash of light and some quick movement caught my eye outside by the pool. It looked like something was by the pool drinking water. I walked down the hallway leading to the sliding glass door that faces the pool, and there I found the cat, scratching like crazy at the glass door to get in. I could see a large hairy animal kneeling next to the pool, leaning over to take a drink. I couldn't believe a bear had made its way to the pool. I leaned in closer to the glass to look outside and to get a better look, but the silhouette I was looking at wasn't exactly a bear. I flipped on the light switch next to me to turn on the outside light. The creature slowly lifted its head and turned back towards me. This thing was massive, built like a linebacker but bigger, and hairy from head to toe with filthy dark brown hair. The pool water was dripping from its mouth as it stared back at me. The cat started to hiss. This beast looked back at me. Its face was sort of like a monkey or an ape. Then it ran off. Its strides were amazing. Maybe four or five steps and it was already out of my line of sight. I then felt safe enough to open the sliding glass door to get a better look at it running away. But boy did I regret that. That awful smell from earlier, that smell was from that thing. I reeled back from the door almost choking from the smell and the cat bolted back inside. Outside, I could hear trees and bushes moving. What was crazier was that I could still hear its footsteps. Rapid, loud stomps as it ran off into the distance. I closed the sliding glass door and I locked it. There was a dark filth that sank to the bottom where it had been drinking. Thankfully, this smell had been blown off by the mountain breeze. But the creature had left behind a trail of dirt and fur. I walked over to the grass where it had taken off. There, I saw the most enormous footprints that I have ever seen. The grass wasn't even wet or damp, which means this thing was heavy enough to press into the hard ground. The rest of the time there, nothing else happened. I fed the cats, cleaned the litter box, watered the plants, and every night I would wait around to see if this creature would come back. That thing never came back, and luckily I never smelled that smell again. When my friend finally came home, he asked how everything was. I didn't say anything about what I saw and said all was fine. I knew he wouldn't believe my story. I never really told anyone about it, but since then I've looked up these stories online that are similar to what I saw. All the research that I've done matches what seems to be a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot. They all line up with exactly what I saw that night. I've randomly asked my friend if he's ever seen anything strange out there, but he always says no. I've never taken care of the house again. I say no and that I'm busy with work or school, but it's always a lie. I just don't know what to do if that thing got into the house. What could you do?